Buenas tardes a todos. Les damos la bienvenida a esta actividad organizada por el Instituto Saras, que se llama Transformando el Futuro, Anticipación en el Siglo XXI, y lleva el mismo nombre que el nuevo libro editado por Riel Miller, que les voy a estar presentando brevemente en unos minutos. Eh, para aquellos que, que no nos conocen mucho todavía, contarles que el Instituto Saras, que es el Instituto Sudamericano para Estudios sobre Resiliencia y Sostenibilidad, es un centro de investigación interdisciplinaria que busca contribuir al desarrollo de futuros sustentables para América del Sur. En Uruguay, las instituciones que forman parte de Saras son la Universidad de la República, la Intendencia de Maldonado y el Ministerio de Vivienda, Ordenamiento Territorial y Medio Ambiente. La actividad de hoy es eh, muy importante para nosotros porque marca el inicio de las actividades de la nueva cátedra en la Cátedra UNESCO en Anticipación Sociocultural y Resiliencia que fue presentada por el Instituto Saras eh, hace algunos meses y recientemente fuimos informados de, de su aprobación, lo cual nos tiene muy contentos. Y en la mesa tenemos a Lidia Garrido, que es la responsable de esta cátedra. Ella es eh, antropóloga especializada en estudios del futuro, tiene años de experiencia en esta temática y como les decía va a estar eh, a cargo de las actividades de la cátedra y luego les, les va a estar contando un poco más sobre los objetivos que tiene la cátedra y que estamos proponiendo desarrollar. Tenemos también eh, como invitado muy especial a Riel Miller, que es eh, doctor en Economía, con más de 30 años de experiencia en la teoría y la práctica del uso del futuro, es líder del proyecto global de UNESCO en alfabetización en futuros y la disciplina de anticipación y es un gran gusto poder contar eh, con él en esta breve visita a Uruguay. Tenemos también en la mesa a Ramón Méndez, que es doctor en ciencias físicas, actualmente director de planificación en la Intendencia de Maldonado, de Video, perdón. Anteriormente fue director de energía y director de cambio climático y él tuvo un papel muy importante en el proceso de la diversificación de la matriz energética de nuestro país. Al lado de Ramón eh, se encuentra Néstor Maceo, que es doctor en ciencias, es docente de CURE, que es el Centro Universitario de la Región del Este de la Universidad de la República, es también director ejecutivo del Instituto Saras y se especializa principalmente en lo que es la gestión y la rehabilitación de los sistemas acuáticos, entendiéndolos como sistemas socioecológicos. Les repaso rápidamente el programa que tenemos preparado para hoy. Va a comenzar Lidia con una breve presentación de la cátedra, luego va a seguir Ruiel Miller con, con una presentación que, que preparó para esta actividad de hoy, que incluye el lanzamiento de su nuevo eh, libro. Luego eh, va a hacer algunos comentarios eh, Ramón Méndez y por último Néstor Maceo. Luego de esas intervenciones vamos a abrir al intercambio con ustedes para que puedan hacer sus comentarios y preguntas para, para cualquiera o todos de los expositores. Eh, dos cosas importantes para mencionar. Una es que estaba programado que participara en la mesa Ana Corbacho, coordinadora académica del espacio interdisciplinario de la Universidad de la República. Por problemas de salud de último momento, lamentablemente no nos puede acompañar en la mesa hoy. Y el segundo aviso es que al terminar la actividad los invitamos a compartir un café a la salida de la sala. Así que con eso, damos la bienvenida y damos inicio a la actividad. Bueno, muchas gracias Micaela, muchas gracias a todos los presentes, muchas gracias Rita Miller por acompañarnos esto, este día aquí en Montevideo, Ramón Méndez y a todo el equipo de Sanas. Bien, voy a hacer una presentación muy, muy breve con algunos titulares sobre la cátedra para bueno, dejar espacio a los expositores y a una oportunidad de intercambio con ustedes. Eh, la cátedra se enmarca dentro del proyecto UNESCO sobre alfabetización de futuros y la disciplina de anticipación. Eh, Alfabetización en Futuros Future Literacy y Disciplina de Anticipación proporcionan las bases teóricas para un mejor uso del futuro. Este uso del futuro no solo nos estamos refiriendo eh, como un 
un área para una expertise, digamos, para su, su uso profesional, sino también en el sentido del uso cotidiano que cada uno de nosotros hacemos del futuro. Y esto es bien importante porque está directamente vinculado a la toma de decisiones. Nuestros imaginarios de futuro, nuestros supuestos anticipatorios, tienen un impacto directo en la forma en que nosotros vemos el presente. El, uh, tal vez eh, podríamos decir de que el mayor descubrimiento dentro del área de las ciencias sociales y humanas haya sido justamente el destacar la invisibilidad y casi una cierta negligencia respecto al haber omitido la importancia que tiene el futuro en la toma de decisión. Eh, no me voy a extender en esto porque seguramente lo va a plantear Río y ustedes van a poder entonces eh, generar un intercambio. Lo dejo simplemente así como una provocación para la reflexión. Eh, y también vincularlo a algo fundamental, que es la capacidad de libertad dentro del de el entendido de del uh, marco teórico de capacidades de Amartya Sen y Marta Nussbaum como es el derecho y garantía de, de, de acceso a, a la libre elección bien, si pasamos por favor la, la diapositiva solo aquí mencionarles o, o el listado de las dos instituciones que forman parte de la red de, que le hemos llamado colaboratorio de apoyo a la cátedra, hay siete instituciones en América Latina y cinco de ellas que están en Europa. Siguiente, por favor. O tengo que dejar yo. Ok. Um, bien. He eh, mencionado cuáles son los objetivos principales, que es de desarrollar investigación, un cierto tipo de investigación, investigación-acción en procesos de aprendizaje y de co-creación de conocimientos, la construcción de, digamos, contribuir a las condiciones de fortalecimiento este, de las capacidades individuales y colectivas anticipatorias e investigar en las dimensiones socioculturales de los sistemas y procesos anticipatorios. En cuanto a actividades principales, referidas a investigación, eh, basada en evidencias sobre sistemas y procesos de anticipación y resiliencia, el fortalecimiento entonces de capacidades anticipatorias, el diseño de procesos eh, para que bueno, esto ocurra eh, como procesos de inteligencia colectiva y de co-creación, eh, un programa de aprendizaje permanente orientado a, a formación eh, en, en Future Leaders y en alfabetizaciones futuros, y también en la, en la facilitación de estos procesos. Y un aspecto muy importante que es el trabajo en redes y en redes de redes con uh, ricos intercambios, por ejemplo, con otras redes que ya hay en Uruguay, así como con instituciones tanto nacionales como regionales e internacionales. Las eh, principales áreas de trabajo eh, están vinculadas a temáticas relativas a aprendizaje y educación, a creatividad e innovación, desarrollo e inclusión sostenible, sistemas socioeconómicos resilientes y el nexo entre eh, investigación y política para la gobernanza anticipatoria. Eh, bien. Bueno. Muchas gracias.
as always, the technology plays games with us. In fact, that's where I want to start. I want to start with that idea. So my first slide is uh, different than robots. And this has happened many times before, uh, where our tools are going to cause terrible grief. They're going to eliminate jobs. They're going to eliminate our civilization. They're going to do all sorts of things. Of course, our tools are us. <laughs> Uh, and the way in which our tools manifest themselves uh, are a function of the way we organize our societies and the way we take them into our daily life. And of course, humans have been taking tools into their daily life ever since the beginning, in the sense that we eat cooked food and we use tools, build fires. So people who have read Harari about the 70,000 years of, of humanity know that these were symbiotic relationships right from the beginning, including with animals as well, so dogs and horses and all that. So our relationship to the world around us is actually much more intimate uh, and much more constant than sometimes it would seem. And part of that distancing is because of the way we use the future, because of the way we put ourselves in position uh, to try and control tomorrow to try and play the role of the engineer who can determine the future and to set ourselves up for failure <laughs> because we can't control the future. So this is one of the crucial questions, I think, of our time, and Lydia has made reference to it, which is how do we transform, in effect, our relationship to the world around us? How do we reconcile ourselves to one of the fundamental aspects of what science knows, which is that we live in a complex, evolving world. So the question here is how to get better at living with complex emergence. And in the present, it might seem, there's just repetition, things that repeat, like the chairs in this room, they'll stay here, we will go. And there's difference things which are different. In the present, there's repetition and there's difference. But, of course, repetition and difference can look very different. <laughs> some things repeat, some things are reformed, some, some things are improved, some things are unknown unknowns. Before this happened, no one could know. We live in a creative universe. I use the image of Brasilia, where there was nothing and then there was something. This happens all the time. And how do we know what we do not know? There actually is a role for social science, for human science. And it has to do with thinking about the way we use the future, why we think about the future, and how we think about the future. We can use the future to discover the present, to grasp novelty, the emergence, to understand systemic boundaries. It turns out because of this sort of magic characteristic of the future, that it doesn't exist, that it has to be imaginary when humans think about it. Because it's imaginary, it has this powerful impact. It allows us to see our assumptions. Because you cannot talk to me about the future without <coughs> making assumptions. You're obliged. Even if I talk tomorrow about the sun rising, I just have to assume it. I don't know. So assumptions are essential for anything that humans say consciously about the imaginary future. So this gives us a chance to do something that we haven't yet really done, I think. So this is illiterate, write for free help. Well, it's a bit difficult to write for free help if you're illiterate. And in the same way, futures literacy is a bit difficult for people to discover without kind of some development of that skill. The future does not exist in the present, but anticipation does. The form the future takes in the present is anticipation. Now, how are we going to discover it? So I put up the image uh, of a particle accelerator and the impact of those particles on, I guess, heavy water or something, and the capturing of those patterns that demonstrate that those particles exist. Well, with the future, it's the same thing. 
if I ask you here in the audience, what are your anticipatory assumptions? You're going to scratch your head and you're going to say, what does he mean? What's he talking about? So we have to have techniques, methods, like accelerators, like microscopes, in order to discover what our anticipatory assumptions are. And that's where this book comes in, Transforming the Future, Anticipation in the 21st Century. It's a book that provides a technical guide to discovering your anticipatory assumptions and learning how to use those anticipatory assumptions to challenge your understanding of the present. So it uses this technique to make the invisible visible, to reveal the anticipatory assumptions. And I'm going to give you some examples so to make it tangible. Um, we've run futures literacy labs all around the world. It's going to be very hard to read these from a distance. But you can just see that there's many different places and many different subjects. Everywhere you go, on any topic, there are anticipatory assumptions. Whether it's the future of science, or whether it's the future of your community school, or your cafe. All of those things, the future of your children. <laughs> those are things where we make anticipatory assumptions. For instance, oftentimes people assume that jobs will be important in the future. Jobs are a relatively recent invention, the 20th century, really. Well, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But it's on the basis of those assumptions that you imagine the future. And because you imagine the future in that way, you imagine jobs, you think, how can I get jobs? It's like if you imagine, I want blueberries. How do I go to the forest and get blueberries? It changes what you do. Everybody who came here today, you imagined that there would be an event here, and you came, and here it is. But the imagination changed what you do. So we can use that characteristic of anticipation to engage an entire country in thinking about its anticipatory assumptions. So here's the example of a two-year project I did for the Prime Minister uh, of Ireland uh, back before 2008, uh, before the crisis, which is a project that looked at Ireland's future using a futures literacy approach. In other words, what we had to do was develop an awareness by the people themselves of their anticipatory assumptions. In other words, you can't ask somebody to read a book without learning the alphabet. One of the experiences that I have as somebody who has designed processes for thinking about the future for the last 30 years, I ran my first big project as a manager in Ontario in 1988, is that it's really quite unfair to ask people to think about the future. It's like saying, please, come draw a painting on the wall because you're a painter, but you're not a painter. Maybe some here is, but we don't have that skill. We don't think about it. But if you want people to be able to engage and think about the future and understand how they're using the future, it's critical to allow that capacity to be developed, to be upgraded slowly, step by step. So that's what we did in Ireland. It took us two years. We invited a lot of people to be involved in the process. We went through the stages so that people could become aware of their anticipatory assumptions, so that they could become capable of changing and selecting their anticipatory assumptions. And that means that they became able to use their imaginations rooted in their own context, in their own history, in their own past, but in their own hopes, and to create their own fears, not the fears of Wall Street, which were, of course, very powerful for the government. So the conclusion that they came to at the end of this, the central argument of this report is that Irish people in business, society, and public service are ready for much greater innovation, more widespread learning, and richer accountability. But the capabilities and practices that support these are inhibited by some features of our organizational system. This argument has significant implications for how we address the current acute crisis and how we lay the foundations for future prosperity and social cohesion. 
This was the, the conclusion of the report. Now, what that report discovered through rigorous scientific evidence-based approach was that the way people think about the future in daily life, in the street, in the community, is not the same as in the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance was quite upset. And they said, you're crazy. What are you talking about? And we had the evidence which showed that if you go out and you talk to people and you work with them, they say something else about their capabilities than if you stay in your building with your numbers and your theories from the middle of, no, let's say the fir first half of the 20th century. I'm talking about Keynes. Um, so there's a question here of how we create our own capacity to think about the future. I'm throwing up another example that came from a little place in France called Nevers, because I know there's maybe some people here who are interested in territorial development. And we ran a six-month exercise in Nevers, and it went as follows. Um, we went through three levels of futures literacy. In session one, there were about 40 or 50 people involved. We had facilitators and a structure and heuristics, meaning tools for people to get their minds into the, pro to the process to re move from tacit to explicit. Because in our heads are many of these assumptions, but they're not obvious. We don't have them in our grasp every moment. So we have to work together with other people to reveal those assumptions. So we did a workshop on innovators. We covered four sectors. It was, it was a very small region. Huh? It's a very small region. It's only it's about two hours from Paris, but it's considered quite backward. And from Paris's perspective, they're not doing what they should be doing. So in session two, we worked with the elected officials, and we took them through the two levels, tacit to explicit, and reframing. level two. And then in level three, we took a group of elected officials, plus some of the citizens, and we, and we said, can you ask some new questions? And one of the new questions they asked was, why do we care what Paris thinks about our future? Why should we accept their idea of what's good for us? We should invent our own idea. There were other conclusions also about beef farming and stuff like that, but that, that's one of the points. So there was a permanent secretary. We had a, a team, like the team that's now uh, being put together around the UNESCO chair. Uh, and they created uh, the capacity to run a futures literacy exercise, which developed futures literacy on the ground in the region. So the reason I'm telling you all this is so that it doesn't sound like this is just an abstract idea. This is learning by doing. It's developing capability to change what people see and do. That's what makes, I think, futures literacy quite important. It allows us to begin to distinguish substitution. So when the policeman is replaced by the traffic light, you have substitution. One substitutes for the other. When you have complementarity, you have a situation where the telephone, which they thought would first of all be like Facebook, destroy our social relationships. The telephone would stop people going to see each other. Grandmother would be left all by herself because all they would do is phone her and say, hello, grandmother, goodbye, grandmother, and that would be it. No, it turned out that they all went together to do things. And it actually was a complementary relationship. But then there's emergence. So when Henry Ford put together the Model T, they were not thinking of suburbs like this. These are things that are unknown and unknown. It's impossible to imagine them. They happen. But this is the richness of complexity. And being able to understand how we use the future helps us to understand the difference. One of the key things that, that happens with strategic thinking and a lot of the consultant work that goes on today is they say, let's think outside the box. But how do you know what the box is? <laughs> and how do you know what's outside? Well, if you think about the future using the futures literacy approach, you begin to see the assumptions that define your box. And you begin to think about new assumptions that allow you to create outside the box. It's another box, but it's a box that you didn't take from the official future given to you by somebody else, or past futures given to you by somebody else, but created by yourself and others in a collective effort. So it helps us to think about conditions of changes and conditions of change. Change within the system, change outside the system, inside in, which is what we do a lot of, that's reform, improving the system. 
Outside in, when we learn from things outside and we change what we're doing inside. Inside out, when innovations in some sectors spill over into other sectors. But then there's outside out, the things that were, that had no name. Continuously, the world around us is experimenting. Not just because humans are experimenting, but because it's really rich. There's lots going on. And all these things are going on, and as we know from many of the great inventions in human history, we don't even notice them. We think they're errors or mistakes, things like x-rays. and you know, It was by, by chance and by error that we discovered this amazing thing. How do we make sense of all these experiments? How do we sense, detect, and make sense of all these experiments? Well, if we're only looking for the future with jobs, and we only think that robots will replace work and that we'll all be unemployed, we certainly won't invent new words and new things to do. It's not like humans don't have a lot that they can be engaged in, caring for each other, caring for the environment, figuring out who I am, what kind of parent, what kind of friend, what kind of thinker. These are all things which have tremendous value and give meaning to life. Aren't these activities that are worth engaging in? These ways of reframing and rethinking give us new words, they give us new ideas, they plant new seeds. Some of those seeds will go nowhere. Some of those seeds will turn into capitalism. Little things that turn big. But you know what? There's no way to know in advance. So you don't know if you're planning the future. All you're doing is planting seeds, making your contribution now. Your legacy to the future is what you do today and how you do it today. And futures literacy helps you to understand that better. I call it walking on two legs. This is funny. This shows you that I'm quite old, and that you know I was uh, when I was my, doing my PhD studies, I studied China quite closely, uh, command planning, Soviet planning, uh, two paradigms, peasants and workers. But the idea of two paradigms coexisting it, is not that far fetched, I think, and that's what I mean by walking on two legs. That we have the paradigm of planning and we have the paradigm of emergence. And like when we walk, actually, we have a moment of uncertainty, always. But our brain adjusts for it. And we get very familiar. And we don't see that we're negotiating a relationship between the two. And so the question of closed, how we prepare contingent futures, what we attempt to create, what we plan for, and open futures, what we discover, revealing what we did not know, these two things can coexist if we're more capable, if we're more futures literate. Uh, it allows us to distinguish search from choice. There's a really, uh, I think, quite, mm, you know, I'm a technocrat, right? I went to work at the OECD as an economist in 1982. So I'm an expert, right? But experts really uh, have to be very, very cautious and I think quite humble. Because in this context, what I find is not necessarily what you should choose. Because ah, the experts find things that their models and the past statistics tell them. But what people choose, as we know, has many different dimensions to it. Distinguishing search from choice is quite an important task. Today, we, we, we try and kind of, because we're looking for certainty and uh, we're trying to protect ourselves, we say, ah, the expert told me. That, that's not the way to think about I mean, decision making, nor search. So understanding the world around us, making decisions, we have to distinguish these things. And we can be more open and confident in our spontaneity. We can be less dependent on legacy systems. One way for a bureaucrat to be right is like the bureaucrat to the pharaoh in Egypt, ancient Egypt. How can the bureaucrat be right forever, almost? Build a pyramid. Lasts a long time, and they would they would be completely correct. In today's world, we invest heavily in legacy systems because we know that we will be right. 